Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Amanda Dobratz. I'm the Marketing and Technology Manager at Northern Clay Center and the curator of Mike's Retrospective, which is called Hidari Uma, Riding the Horse Backwards, Embracing the Unknown. I'd like to start today by respectfully acknowledging that Northern Clay Center is located on Dakota land. This event is made possible in part by the voters of Minnesota through a Minnesota State Arts Board operating grant, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to one of probably my favorite ceramic artists in the whole world. His work has touched me like nobody else's, Mr. Mike Norman. Mike's work is part allegory, alchemy, poetry, and Mingay Soda. Mike grew up in Duluth near the shore of Lake Superior with his artist parents about whom the neighbors would whisper, they're bohemians. <laughs> he and his sister spent their childhood reading, painting, building forts, and creating imagined adventures in the wilderness. At his grandparents' farm, he developed a deep love of animals and a particular affinity for the big black and brown floppy-eared dog named Rip. You can see Rip and other animals Mike has loved over and over again in the illustrations on his pots and in the figures in his sculptures. These animals have become part of his lexicon, his personal taxonomy of stand-ins for nostalgic adventure and poetic iconography. Again, thank you so much for coming. If you haven't yet, please do stop in NCC to see Mike's retrospective. It's up until the 18th. You can also find it online via a 3D tour on our website. So that's enough of me blathering. I'm going to turn my camera around and let Mike take the reins. There he is. Also, it's Mike's birthday today. So if you want to wish him a happy birthday in the comments, I know he'd appreciate it. Ah, well, <laughs> I uh, am here. Uh, thank you all, you Zoomers, for coming. I, I uh, as you know, this is uh, a Mike Norman Pottery production, uh, first run through of a live performance, and we will carry on as best we can. Uh, lots of faux pas. Uh, uh, probably there'll be uh, comments from the peanut crowd to guide me through a few issues and sort of with a big hook, pull me along when I start rambling too much. So anyway, uh, there's really not too much I can say, but uh, I will say, beam me up, Amanda. <laughs> Here we are. You're beamed. <laughs> if you uh, take a look around uh, the studio from this point of view, is uh, the that is occupied three people. And from where Jan is standing back is the well, where Janice said is the middle area, and then where you see horses in the background, that to the window wall is basically my studio area. The uh, throne room uh, with a large gas kiln and four electric kilns is to the right or to the left, or right where I'm standing. Uh, in that space. This area was formerly a construction workshop for Gilham production, carpentry. Um, he, in his later years, took a like thing to making ceramics, took a course from Bob Broderson at the St. Paul Hi, school. Grandpa. There, uh, there he's become infatuated uh, with ceramics. He and Gil uh, got together with uh, Bob Self, built a kiln in the building next door to the current uh, space that we're in now. Uh, over the years, that kiln went through a lot of uh, ups and downs and the last one was a small explosion that blew the roof off of the kiln <laughs> and it sort of halted production for a while. Uh, the building was sold uh, that where the kiln was. Gary Crawford who owns the building now where we are uh, asked Donovan Palmquist to rebuild this gas kiln where it is it, in its current location in the garage that now is that kiln room. 
I've been here uh, on two separate timelines, uh, about 15 years each. Uh, 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 I would say I've been here since, oh no, I didn't even write this down. Uh, well, currently I've been here about 15 years. Prior to that, about 10 years at Philip Rickey Studio on uh, Drake Street in St. Paul, uh, where I learned a number of uh, post-production skills, techniques that he showed me uh, through his work with Stone. Uh, and then going back in another 15 years, I was at this location. So anyway, I've been pretty much here all along. Uh, you can uh, uh, begin to see the the uh, the pieces that I have out there. Um, done, I think around 2000, 2000 and uh, four, six, something like that. Um, the, uh, no. As it is my birthday, and I had this weird brother in Las Vegas, <laughs> I have to answer this. Now, Jack, all right, all right. I'll do what you asked me to do. You didn't have to remind me, I was getting set to do it anyway. So, hang on watch the uh, production or TV or whatever it is, uh, the Zoomer. Are you a Zoomer? Yes, all right, all right, all right. Do your business now. Uh, he's basically a Nighthawk and this is early for him. So see you later, Jack. Okay, Jack, you might not believe, uh, goes by the way, Jack Norman, his last name is Norman, of course, but he likes to be called Jack Sheeno. <laughs> you, you don't know why, and I'm not going to tell you, but it is crazy, and we have to go with it. What the odd thing that he asked me to do was to recite a poem that he loves, and in the mode of of Jack as a Las Vegas potter, uh, living the nightlife, and uh, whatever else he does, I have to take on the <laughs> persona. So here we are, Jack in his Western attire, and as Joe Biden had a portfolio to guide him through this, this production presentation, so do I. Jack loves the British Romantic Fathers, uh, excuse me, <laughs> poets. And he dearly loves William Butler Yeats. And so this is his take on, I think, Yeats is called Vacillation. It's a shortened version of it. And it goes by, my 82nd year has come and gone. I sat a happy birthday man in Dunn Brothers coffee shop, an open book in an empty stoneware cup on a wooden tabletop. Well, on the shop and the street I faced, my body of a sudden blazed and 23 minutes more or less it seemed so great my happiness that i was blessed and i could bless my my blessings have come through my friends joe Giannetti, who is to the left jan davies to the right Joe has been my friend for over 50 years, Jan for 30 or so plus years, uh, second marriage. I still uh, 
have great fondness for my first wife who unfortunately died recently. And uh, our kids, Amanda, Zach, and Jenny. And now with grandkids for all of us, Cameron, Vivian, and Diane. We used to call her little Diane. And then when big Diane was living, it's such a sad thing. And she only died uh, a little less than a month and a half ago. She would have loved hearing this performance, production, whatever you want to call it. I think I shall just sort of begin uh, and sort of off the top of my head with a little bit of guidance from this, these papers. Begin with uh, these sculptures. What I'm doing today is that is basically uh, building uh, uh, clay pieces. Uh, I've done many years of clay throwing uh, on the wheel, which we'll see over uh, a little bit past where Jan is. But this piece, the, the horse on raft and the escape from Hades uh, by uh, my, uh, my dear, wonderful, uh, uh, what should I say, my, my, my guide and my, my counselor, uh, um, the, uh, I know, my guide. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, and these, these three pieces are rather early and represent sort of a, a torrent in the life in a sense, but also uh, an ex exploration. So uh, as I was, uh, explaining the back area is the studio area. We have uh, some work here, some forms that I use to construct the pieces. These, these pieces were used, I used a form uh, made out of styrofoam. And there's two parts, and uh, some of the pieces were made over the, the uh, styrofoam, and some were made within the styrofoam. These, these pieces have yet to be fired at high fire. So the inside the form, the piece of slab of clay is laid on, and it's sort of gently pushed in. And they're resting there for a little while until they get to come to their heart. This is the opposite side of the form, or half of the form. And you just sort of gently lay the slab of clay over the top of it. The slabs of clay were made off of the slab roller behind uh, Amanda, uh, who was running the uh, production of this show. <laughs> and, uh, so, well, while we're here, uh, I might as well show you this piece. It's a, uh, it's a piece of uh, sculpture that was made from this interesting shape. So you have the, so you have the piece of clay. You have the form, lay the piece of clay, and gently sort of push it into the void of the opening of this uh, cutout. And you'll get a, a shape much like this, or whatever whatever shape that you might have. You know, I've made pieces like this, sort of like a figure. So anyway, that is one way of creating that I have used to make uh, sculptures with. I've used uh, styrofoam pieces shaped into a boat form. And, and in this case, this boat was made from this styrofoam. In the firing process, it has shrunk a little bit, so it doesn't quite fit. 
as it did originally. And then in turn, I use this shape to lay uh, slabs of clay into it and create the boat for it. If you were at the uh, show or have seen the show, there is a book that is that states says the uh, the search for Hokusai. The search for Hokusai. Thank you. Um, Hokusai is a old Japanese printmaker who has done did many 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 good cuts and printed. And he did a famous one that probably everybody knows is the view of Mount Fuji over the Kanagawa Bay. And in my case, uh, uh, I used this form as a book shape. And within this the two pages, I've created a, uh, a background for a boat with my little creatures who are called my rescuers. And that is a theme that prevails through all my work is that in a sense, even my own uh, being is that we are all supported and rescued by many, many people throughout our lives. And none of us can say that we are, the, that our work is the product of only ourselves. It is, it is all the people we make. We, Jan, uh, you, Amanda, uh, Joe Ginetti, my dear old friend from years back, uh, crazy, Italian, wonderful, boisterous uh, uh, photographer who has become a, a great uh, uh, artist in his own right in uh, painting and print media. So anyway, that's, uh, uh, that is one, one little side note. Uh, just a quick identification of another way of using clay and forming it is creating a, another shape, uh, laying the, the piece of clay into it like that, and then uh, it's shape, it shape, take it out when it's a little bit uh, leather hard and uh, carry on. This is unusual because they haven't drawn anything into it. It's just clean. Okay, a little quick uh, tour uh, in the, this little gallery. This shows uh, many people who have influenced me or things that I, people like, uh, images I love, uh, characters, Zadarichi, a great uh, Japanese uh, man of spirit and goodwill, and, but also subject to the, uh, is drawn to all sorts of uh, the world of gambling and women and fighting and so forth. But he has a good heart. Jan Davies, my love. My dad, William Norman, who was a painter, uh, well known uh, back in the 40s, along with Sid Fossum, Cameron Boone, Matt Lesseur. Me, when I was uh, in my uh, I wouldn't say hippie days, but uh, uh, well, you could say that. Hot days. Hot days, yeah, yeah I guess so. Uh, some pictures, uh, here's a picture of uh, a firing from Richard Bresenhan's kiln, uh, whose work has helped me in, in a couple of occasions to fire work. Uh, Jan and myself, uh, we've had a show together. Uh, an old friend, uh, uh, a piece. I'm, I have a great love of painting and other arts. Uh, Northern Clay did this little piece for me. Uh, um, here's a piece of uh, Jim Denemy, uh, really well known Minnesota artist. Well, and if I, if I can just chip in, Mike, that little piece that you showed from the Clay Center is actually a little mock-up of the original Claymobile when you did the drawings for us, actually. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you, here, here are two sketchbooks. Uh, I, 
I do a lot of writing and drawing and uh, working from with paper. I am not a, a, I haven't done a lot of finished uh, prints or paintings as such. It's pretty much all clay. And it is somewhat of an a issue because clay is, has such a, for me, a long time span from, from ideas to completion. And then on top of that, that kiln sometimes doesn't complete what you want it to do and you have to live with it. And that's sort of a philosophy that I mean, I'm sort of love, but at the same time, I sort of hate. But what else can you do? Uh, I was with, with Warren McKenzie, my mentor, teacher, uh, great friend, and wonderful potter and inspired, who inspired so many, many people over the years. Uh, on our trip to Japan uh, with uh, Wayne Branham, Bernie Gray, Tim Crane, myself, and uh, Warren, of course. And then we met uh, two other Japanese people, Taiko Tanaka and Shin Tanaka, there, who guided us through some early parts of our trip. But then we went on our own for about two or three weeks. And this is one of the th pieces I found in a little uh, flower shop that had a bunch of pots in the little cabinets un under tables. And we asked, you know, what is this? You know, what are these pieces? And my gosh, you know, look at this thing. This is just a knockoff uh, sake bottle. And it, I don't know what it says, uh, but it probably is just a description, a name of the shop, and where it's located. Incredible. I haven't done, uh, uh, well, I guess I try to appropriate some of the uh, look of Japan and early potters uh, over the centuries. Uh, this is my little take on sort of a, uh, oh, I don't know. Zen, maybe, who knows? It, maybe that's a little bit presumptuous to say. Okay, so here's a, a little little cup that I threw, actually. And I love uh, words or, or using, um, bringing in other elements of, of, of the arts of, of the world into my work, sometimes successfully, more times not. But anyway, this this one, uh, this little cup, Japanese cup, in Japan is called a yunomi. And and I like uh, play of on words. And here I say, you know me. Why are you N O W M E? You know me. As a potter who dreams of electric dancing sheep and of wild bees making sweet gold and honey from my old failures. I'm a stranger in paradise and living in a cave of dreams. And when I wake, the sun comes out and angels dance and And oh my gosh, I can't quite read. It. Sometimes glaze obscures the, the words, and I've lost that particular dance and something up cosmic topes of love for mental therapy. I'll have to revisit that. Uh, so anyway, go back to uh, the, the work. Um, these are forms that I use to create uh, 
the forms of these horse engines. And, and this one happens to be made beginning with this piece. Probably I should have had this as an example, but this one, maybe, I guess I don't, maybe I do have one there. Anyway, this is mounted on, on four corners. You lay a slab of clay in there. And you sort of gently stretch and push the clay down into the space. And that, that space now uh, looks like this. So if you imagine this clay coming this way, creating this form, rounded form here, that is this area of this, this, this shape is defined in this area of the sculpture. And so then I go on to add, to create the opposite side. And, and then start adding onto it. And my work mostly revolves around people and animals and how they interact and how we interact with the world and the struggles that we have and the hopes and dreams that we also have. I mean, that's a little highfalutin, but I mean, that's part of what I try to do. Uh, another way of presenting this, this cup, which is in Japanese is called a yunomi. I should have started saying that. And you know, we start a taller than wide tea drinking vessel. So you can see the diameter is not as, is, is less than the height of the shape. And I started playing around with that, that, you know, that word, you know me. And I might write on a piece, you know me, but you don't. Or, you know me, let's dance. Or, don't be a stranger, you know me. Do you know me? I'm the woman with dark eyes who knows the rumba in strange steps and jumpy ry rhythms from the mountains of Bulgaria. Or the last one on this page, it says, tell me, is it a you know me? Or you know me? The commander smiled and said, the time is to board the, it is time to board the Kubayashi. Uh, how should I follow up on that? Uh, Hands on the ground. He, he, uh, Kubayashi Isa is an old uh, Japanese poet from the mid 17 to 1800s who was noted for his haikus. He is one of the four major uh, noted haiku uh, writers in Japanese history. So I just, uh, I just love uh, the idea of Kubayashi and the, the connection uh, and, and his, uh, well, Kubayashi was a haiku poet, I should say. And I love the way Japanese sort of are down the essence of living in our observation is in just in three short phrases. In my uh, one and only haiku, uh, and I probably will never do another one because I don't know if I can uh, top this one. Pants falling down. My butt is disappearing. Getting old too fast. Haikus 
are five, seven, and five syllables in three lines. That's it, no more. And uh, what more can you ask for out of life, you know? <laughs> okay, let's turn around and go back into the- uh, Do you need your glasses, maybe? The studio. Um, do I have my glasses? Yeah, you could give me just in case. Do you want your notes? Are you free flowing? Uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm free flowing, but uh, it's a, uh, since this is a run through for the uh, first uh, uh, before the play starts, so to speak, uh, we uh, uh, I do need this. Uh, uh, over here uh, to the right is our Spider's. two sculptures that are in process. And we'll, you'll learn a little bit more about this a little bit later, but this is a, a glaze fired on this sculpture. It's a horse, it's a spider horse with uh, strangely uh, 10 legs. And these, these are the spider's little juvenile kids. It was made uh, from that form on the back wall. And you can very much easily see the shape of it. Uh, this glaze, uh, it was fired at around uh, 1200, 1300 degrees, I guess. Yeah, I suppose around there. It has a lot of copper in it. And you'll learn about that uh, short in a short while. Here's a, uh, a piece that uh, is in progress. I, and the legs, this leg broke. And I, I'm attempting to re-secure it. Uh, and we'll see if it's successful or not. But anyway, so this is the form that was used to make the piece and you'll see how how that piece was made by uh, and, uh, another form behind me on the table. But it, it has a very long neck, uh, different colors of clay uh, make up the, the striations and those will show up in the firing or the glaze firing. I wanted to balance out the length of the neck by extending the tail. So that that's what, how it, in my mind, how it, uh, um, I'm trying to make it successful, not unbalanced. So that's my attempt. So we'll go around and I'll uh, give you a little idea about how uh, I proceed making these pieces. Uh, this, this form uh, and all of these forms that I have uh, some on the floor uh, this elephant over there, uh, and there's another elephant behind it that uh, was created, and now it's finished. It was fired at, at Kono for lower temperatures, 12, 1500 degrees. The, this, this horse, these two, these two horses came from two halves, uh, slightly different leg positions. So we have one, this would be this form here, that side. On the other side, the legs, same on the back, but a little extended in the front. By the way, this is a the Shino glaze. And I can say that Jack Shino, uh, who was a, I didn't explain too well, but he's a Las Vegas potter, uh, presented this to me as a gift. Uh, uh, I don't know about 10 years ago as a gift. Uh, the glaze recipe, I should say. Yeah. It is normally rusty red. In this case, uh, when you have a heavy reduction in a kiln, it will pick up the carbon. 
And all this drag is from the uh, kiln atmosphere, which was uh, had a, a lot of unburned fuel in the firing during the firing. And it's penetrated early on, it penetrated the glaze because it, at that point in time, the glaze was dry and open. The carbon, very minute particles laid on the surface and also penetrated into the place itself. The chino itself has a, has a very high in soda and soda melts at a very low, relatively low temperature. As it, the temperature rises in the kiln, the glaze, the soda melts and they call it capturing the carbon. Uh, and that carbon doesn't burn out because of the, uh, the soda over it has melted and it is basically sealed within the piece. This is unusual to have it almost black, but uh, pretty, pretty, pretty good. <laughs> and so anyway, here's that form. Again, um, done basically uh, in the manner which I'll, I'll show you right now. I'm gonna try to find a little spot. I can rest my elbows on the table, so I'm not shaking all over. Um, let's see. Very, uh, I'm not seeing the form. Is it, behind, is it behind you, Mike? There's a stack of them. Ah. All right. So here we have the sheep, which is very close to this piece. Uh, much more uh, defined, I think you could, you could say. Uh, by the way, this piece was fair that. Richard Bresnahan's kiln at St. John's Pottery. It, it really is one of the best pieces they made. Uh, and not only because I like the form, but what happened within the firing. And so much of this work that we do is sort of like the serendipity of life that sometimes things just fall in place. Uh, this piece was away from the heat of the kiln. Uh, imagine a, a, this, this huge kiln, which is, I don't know, 80 feet long or thereabouts. It was sitting, the, the kiln length was this way. It was sitting, standing uh, or positioned so that the heat, this side was hotter. And what it did as, as the heat rises, the clay begins to shrink or, or it tightens up. And, and this side, so this side is hotter than, than the back side. And you, or actually, sorry, you can even see how it is leaning to, in that direction because the heat uh, caused this side to shrink more than the back side. Uh, but the backside shows all the evidence of the wood ash that was flying in, in the kiln and has encrusted on the surface of it. It was also the same on the, on the blue side, but most of it had just melted and penetrated or become the, the glazed part of it. I don't know if you, if you notice uh, carefully, but Think of these two bumps as shoulders, and this is the, the neck. And, and so we have a lovely little torso of a figure, of a woman in this case, which I'm quite fond of. And so anyway, that's, uh, that's the story of that. This piece, uh, 
I will start with this fabric layer that I stretched out earlier this morning. The way it, the way that this piece evolves, or did evolve, just the same one, is that I have this slab of clay like this, and I position it so that it is larger than obviously the cutout. I see where the the edge of the, the feet are, and I will trim trim the clay back at that point where the where the legs or hooves are of the horse. We we or I begin to lift up the clay a little bit and sort of inch it down into that space. And slowly begin, you can begin to see the form of the horse appearing. And we sort of nudge it and push it around a little bit and stretch it, the clay I'm speaking of. And sort of draw my finger around like so to um, define the edges. And at this point, uh, I might, uh, depending on what I want to do with the, the, what I'm thinking of by way of, of this horse, but in this, at this point in time, I, I'll, I'll, uh, this part right here is where the, the, where it's scooped down. And uh, this area up here, the flat area, is defined by this outer edge of the horse. And then, and then on the other side, we have this, the same thing. Uh, the, the, the opposite of this here, the, the cutout area. But in this case, this particular horse, I have a third slab of clay in the middle, which I rather, rather like, uh, or like it left. So, uh, what I, the way I do, well, this, I might sort of define the ears like so, and this go around the back like that, and maybe make the tail like so. Uh, maybe that's a little bit too, if you get it, uh, you have to sort of think about strength when, on these things too. And you don't want to make things too delicate, or at least that's, that's my taste. Uh, this, this guy is going to have a big muscle. Uh, I've always liked horses. I, I've never been around horses a lot. Uh, there were a, a couple of horses at my grandparents' place uh, in Duluth. And they lived within the city limits, but they had no running water or electricity. Uh, not common, uh, um, even back in the 40s. Um, so in a way, I, I, um, I was sort of exposed to another world or another life 
in a way. Uh, uh, they're, they're Finlanders, they uh, came from Finland. Uh, first, my grandfather, uh, John Pentilla, um, came, uh, found work in Minnesota uh, in the lumber world, cutting trees. Uh, and after, I'm, I don't know too, I don't know the details of their early life, but he was married, uh, sent for his wife, uh, Elsa Ventilla. And uh, for a while they lived in, across the tracks in the civilized town, part of town, Duluth, quote, civilized. And, uh, and then were able to buy a small piece of property on the north uh, edge of uh, the north side of the tracks. And this would be where the 35W comes down into Duluth. And then you have a, uh, a old railroad line. And it's sort of within that triangle where they had a small farm and where I spent many, many summers and then many adventures. And learned about cows and chickens and dogs and cats and and uh, picking strawberries and running wild and stuff like that. It, it was great. So that was a important part of my growing up. Uh, the unfortunate thing was that uh, I was learning Finnish when I was a kid at that point in time, but as, as it is sometimes with families that in my parents' case, my mom spoke Finnish, of course, but my dad didn't. And he sort of felt separated from the family in that sense. So we didn't speak Finnish. And I basically sort of have lost touch with what Finnish I knew during those days. But, but not lost touch with the heritage that uh, I learned and uh, have over the years used in and continued to love. Uh, my uh, grandmother uh, lived on the north end, northern part of Finland, and her relatives were of the Sami people, the, the Finlanders, who, well, people who spoke Finnish, not not exactly, perhaps you would say a dialect, but that, that is where on my grandmother's side is my connection to that part of the world. And that I have, um, I think, the sort of, um, I'm drawn to the unknown spirit, uh, animals, the woods, the wild. And that's probably why I went into forestry uh, when I was young, I actually didn't want to be, become an artist uh, because my both my mom and dad were artists and sort of had a hard life for a while until my dad moved us all to Minneapolis and we sort of had to start living the city life. And which was all right, but boy, I didn't, didn't meet up with uh, running around in the hills of Duluth and and the Bay uh, of Park Point. Uh, I will, will say my dad uh, did have many great friends and he, uh, many great artist friends uh, and who, who he himself was part and parcel to. Mac Lesseur, St. Flossum, uh, Bernie Quigg, uh, Cameron Booth, really well known, Claire Mars, there, uh, so that was another important element, uh, that sort of bohemian world that he brought from that part of, and then what my mom brought in from that sort of natural uh, Finnish um, sort of outsider, because in those days, back in the 30s and 40s, Finns were not really well treated and uh, in much like, say, the Italians weren't treated very well when they first came into the New York area. 
But anyway, so there, there's that is a little bit part of the history that uh, precedes or has influenced me. Are you looking for your notes? Now I'm, I'm looking for a, a little sheet of. Uh, to show mm -hmm. removing this, this piece, I need to use, what I do, this is the procedure I do. I have a, I formed a piece, take this little chunk of paper, it acts as a little barrier between, uh, or a release, I guess you might say, uh, from a wet clay to in this piece. If I put the clear clay down on, on this, it would stick somewhat, and I couldn't, I couldn't uh, easily remove the form. Okay, I didn't push this nose in very far. I have to backtrack a little bit and pull the paper away. And as you can see, I'm pushing it up a little bit to finish the muzzle of the horse. So that is one side of the horse. How is our timeline? We, it is one o'clock, so we're ha we're halfway through your time. All right. So I guess we have time for another another half. Here. Yeah. So we'll, we'll go over here, and uh, this is the history piece. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what I do, I, I use these to these these as as probably all you potters know how to do it. But the idea is to lay these down whatever width you want. You can uh, of clay that you want to cut away thin or medium or thick, and I'm going to do it thick. But I'm going to use this hunk of clay rather than this one. It's a little stiffer and a little bit larger in size. The, and it's a little bit uh, a little bit denser or, or not quite as wet as this other clay, and so it would be a little easier to use. So the way we do, the way I cut the clay, is I have these two sticks like so, and this is a little twisted wire, two, and attached to little handles, little ends. And with your fingers down on the, on the, these uh, sticks, slowly draw, So you draw the wire through. So, all right, so take off that. Now, so we have this level clay that is the thickness of this. So uh, we come around to the other other department, and this is the uh, the slab roller that uh, Gary Crawford 
purchased uh, some years ago and it is a you know what it I can't tell what it is right now. These wheels control the the height of this roller. So, Mike, I'm gonna come around the other side. Okay. Uh, I think people will get mad at me with that view. Apologize, folks, while I bumble through. <laughs> We have plenty of time to wait there. See if somebody wants to talk tonight. I don't, because I can't believe I've been talking this long. Normally, <laughs> normally I sit in the studio silent as a church mouse. Not that I go to church that often, but similar. And I, truthfully, I, I'm, I, I'm more uh, of a, uh, I wouldn't say I really practice Zen that much, but that is sort of the where my heart probably is most. Uh, my my uh, my love. Uh, I, I love many many forms of um, art and in ceramics. I love um, uh, some of the wonderful African. Um, people's work, especially around uh, what is now known as Nigeria. Uh, the people called Banawana. Uh, I don't know too much about them, but they make these just, or have made in the past, these just beautiful jars. Uh, they're, those are, to me, those are really, the crafts peoples of the world, along with many of the old Japanese and Chinese, all the people who made pots for for living, story, uh, preparing food, storing food, uh, serving food. Um, we do. We modern potters do that a little bit. Uh, some some much better than I and I have to confess that I, I never have been a really a great thrower, uh, even though I might uh, uh, like to pretend that I'm a, a fantastic. But regardless, uh, the what we I, I know some people are going to complain uh, or, or disagree, but. Uh, I, I don't think uh, we can compare what we do with their work. Uh, we're, we are of a different, we have a different lifestyle and, and we make things more for our, some for use and so much more for embellishment of our, our space, I think. And, and, but at the same time, they're nurturing, I think. Uh, so anyway, enough for that. Uh, this, this controls the height and, uh, and what these, these are two pieces of canvas and they allow the, the clay to stretch uh, as it passes through the rollers. Uh, and if you didn't have the canvas down, it would stick to the surface of the, of the tabletop, the wood or the plasticized surface. Uh, so anyway, it's just, just another part of the, uh, uh, a tool that uh, help, helps, helps me, Helps make the uh, well, part of the creative process, part of the creating the piece. And as it goes back and forth through the ro rollers, each time uh, the rollers compress it a little bit. Uh, as it goes through once, I, I tighten it, tighten these, turn the screw, and it lowers the top wheel a little bit. And I push the canister, the wheel, uh, 
and this side helps pass it right through and roll it again. And each time I roll it, it stretches it out. Now I want it to be at least maybe 14 inches. So I maybe need to go one more pass through. And then it's probably wide enough this way, but it needs to be stretched this way. So I pull it up, turn it around 90 degrees. As you work the clay back and forth, it will get a little wet where the canvas gets wet. And so ideally, uh, you would have more than one, one pairs of canvas to alternate so that when it when the canvas gets wet, it starts clay starts sticking to the uh, canvas and it and it doesn't stretch, it doesn't allow the rollers to, or doesn't allow the clay to ex begin to stretch back because it's sticking to the canvas. Right now it's just sort of loose on top of it. So turn that down, turn the big wheel. And take the ruler and we measure. 14 inches, 12. I think it's good. Sometimes I might take a, uh, uh, it's a little bit thick. I need to, I'm going to do it one more time, two more times. Usually, I won't say exactly how, uh, I don't know the exact thickness that we could see the clay should be. But if you're making Large pieces, you want a thicker slab of clay. Small pieces, you can use a thinner piece of clay for the structure strength of the piece that you're making or creating. All right, so we'll go with this. They can pick it up like so. And we'll carry it around. And, uh, Go back to the table. And what, what, I, what you need to do is now, or well, what I need to do is now make the opposite half. So uh, right now, this side is represented by this on this piece. Oh, by the way, this is fired in the only with wood in, in Richard's kiln. So the the rust, the coarse gritty area is wood ashes that have uh, adhered to the surface. On this side, the wood ashes are starting to melt. All right, so backtrack to this again. Lay the clay down. Uh, stretch it out a little bit, find where the feet are, the base of the, the legs are. Adjust it a little bit so, so the legs will, will uh, where the clay can drop down into that void where the legs are. Where the, where the hooves are, will be. Uh, sort of, in, it is sort of inch it. The clay stretches a little bit. Sometimes they um, uh, lift it up and push it in to help uh, begin to form the, the shape of the horse. Actually, some people call this a donkey. Uh, uh, somebody, somebody did. I think it more. It's more, more of a. Well, the, I, 
this the real name of this is uh, uh, in, in Japanese it's uh, Uma is horse and uh, and I think of it as a a tomb uh, although in, in my, I call it a Korean tomb horse anyway so that's a side note for that I, I like one of the things I, I, I probably haven't expressed uh, or told you about is my fondness of words and stories uh, and how my work is an extension uh, of our, my life, our lives, and what we have experienced and some, some with difficulties, some with great, uh, wonderful things happening. So anyway, this, I just wanted to make that known because uh, the, the little piece that I told you about the T-Bowl, the you know me, uh, that those things are sort of like little stories in a way, and and I uh, our living creates our stories, and and how we interact with people, uh, it's it's really important uh, for me, and and I can't uh, uh, exclude any uh, that. Uh, and especially the influence of people in, in my life that uh, you don't you don't go through life by yourself everything is interacted is all connected uh, I don't know if I have any pieces that show a uh, well I do the the horse photograph you want to go over there the horse and his photograph has, and I didn't really talk too much about it. This is something from both of you. <laughs> the horse over there, and has was created by trailing um, a different color clay over the body of the horse. So this is the area that I sort of actually just sort of randomly poured clay over it, uh, uh, liquid slip, which is, or clay, which is, uh, has a lot of water in it, it's called slip. And within th that defined area, I begin to use this forms that may suggest an image. Uh, I think this is pretty clear that this, these hips and legs and torso and this natural flowing of the hair it just sort of fits to having a person. Uh, animals and people, uh, rabbits, uh, dogs here, uh, looks like a horse here within the horse. So this area was pretty much unglazed except for a little wash of of the watery part of a glaze or like an ash glaze that has a lot of um, soluble chemicals in it like soda or potassium. And that will uh, tone the clay color. And in this case, it's sort of rusty. Um, this color is a little bit red and sometimes it becomes a little bit more like this, uh, uh, same, same horse, but a different uh, exposure. So the the reason why I am quite fond of doing this is that all, we have our, a body of ourselves, but then things flow in and out of it. And these are what flows through it are in this case represented by 
people and rabbits and figures and uh, other animals, horses, they, they all are part of living and part of life. Um, and then, then you have the, the layers of horses. You have one horse, two horses, three, four horses there. So that's, that's the connection uh, or that's where my heart is, is how things are interrelated and, and all things are influencing each other all the time. And the better we, uh, better we can be uh, truthful and honest and caring, uh, I think the better our lives and our, our world uh, can be. It's, it's, a, it's a tough thing. And uh, there's an equal amount of opposite. So, you know, the yin and yang and everything, you know. So, so anyway, this is, this is another course being done that will look somewhat like that in the end. Let's see if I can get in there so people can see the different colors of the clay. Yeah, I don't know if you could. I think you can see. I'm just not sure what the quality of the video, but it, lo it looks, I can think I can see it through there. Yeah, the light, if the light was a little bit more in a diagonal, it maybe would show up the edge or so, but it is, uh, oh, one thing that Dan is pointing out is that if you, if you can maybe see a little Sorry. netting on the legs in the background and these are some glaze tests on the same type of clay showing a different, giving me ideas about how to handle this, uh, the glazing of this piece. Uh, it, will, it won't be quite as rusty as that, maybe a little bit more brownish like that for, for the image part. The background will have this greener, quality, I think. Um, and like, like, I don't know if I talked about it, but the lot of things break once in a while. And I'm, I'm never one to say, that's it. I like, I like to give things another chance. And that at the same time, I think sometimes they can be enhanced. Uh, by the, the process, where the process shows us different things. And in this case, uh, these two legs have cracked and the uh, ears broke. And I'm sure you know, uh, in Japan and other cultures, especially Japan that I'm familiar with is the repair that is done to uh, pieces that are broken or that have cracked. And they don't try to hide the cracks in the, in the uh, repair. Uh, more often than not, you'll have a thin edge of gold or gold paint that mark where the crack is. And that's just another element of things that impact our lives and, and that are our scars. Some are hidden, some are more exposed. Okay, so back to, back to the future as, as I said. <laughs> I, I do have a question for you. Yeah. So when we were sorting through things to determine what could be in the show and what couldn't, or what could be sold in the gallery and what couldn't be sold, this was a discussion that Amanda and I had together mm -hmm. about finding that little crack piece or that mm -hmm. strange piece that shows you the real hand of the artist instead of having everything to be perfect. And yet sometimes those are the pieces that, oh, they can't be sold in the gallery. Somebody will see a crack. But when you're doing shows on your own or from your own studio, 
you get an opportunity to talk about the imperfections. Amanda, what would you say to that too? For me, it's really one of the most charming parts of Mike's work because I, I love that, especially on the functional work, if there's a crack and it still holds water, it's still functional, so there's nothing wrong with it. And it's just part of the story. And the pieces already have so much narrative to them that then that adds, for me, it adds your narrative too. So whatever thing was happening in your head while you were drawing on it, plus the actual story of its making. And I, 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 lo I love it so much. It's one of the ways that I think that Mike is really different from his peers who also studied under Warren is that like, they talk about this like wabi-sabi menge stuff, but really Mike's pots embody that in Oh, I think a lot truer. <laughs> Are you, you probably don't need to finish putting this piece together, but I'm dying to see the mystery piece over here. Okay. Okay. How, okay. How, how, how the We're doing well. We're doing good. We and we have time for a little poetry. Maybe Amanda and I can have a little dialogue or even ask some questions. Yeah, and I bet we have questions from the audience too yes. that Allison's been feeding for us. Yes, wonderful. Well, that's just odd, right? Right. But you have to read some more poetry and show the, the surprise. Oh, yeah. But All right. Do you think people are interested in seeing them put together these pieces? If I can do okay. the Raise chat <laughs> without some people are saying, yes, please, you want to see them get put together. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, folks. I love real time feedback. Kind of when I teach this way, I always find it very odd that to have no, <laughs> no audience feedback. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it probably is good for me because uh, uh, working in my studio is always pretty, pretty uh, private, and uh, having an audience of a uh, hundred. Uh, or so, uh, and I know it intimidates me a bit. So, uh, let me uh, move this piece over here, you know. Okay. And I see your questions coming in, folks. Thank you. I'm also doing handheld filming. So, we're going to let Mike put together this piece. And then maybe um, the lovely Allison Beach could help us field some questions that she's seeing coming through. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to hold steady and get a good view for you guys and reading at the same time is a little hard. <laughs> it is, right? Thank you. I'll finish cutting this on there. Oh, that might be interesting. So what I want in here, I want to create a couple ears. And one thing about, good about clay is that you can you can um, add things and uh, change a mark. Uh, Maybe not as easily as painters, but it still can be done. And let me do this now. So, on my uh, grandparents, I didn't really say much, but uh, they did have a little little farm within the loose uh, city limits and they sold they had a couple of cows and they sold milk to the community in the close neighborhood the um, um, no uh, a uh, couple couple of bricks be from here. What, what, I, what I want to do is, use. or I can actually I can use this.
because it does support like this. That was like the and so you're getting a little ahead of myself, I think. And what we do is put this down a little bit. It's to, uh, and what I'm doing now is scoring the clay so it roughs up the surface of it a bit. And that way, uh, there's more surface and, you know, so when I put another scored piece from this, when I put this piece together with this one, those two scored areas will adhere much more solidly and won't separate in the drying process. And by adding a little bit of wet clay like that, it's the same kind of clay as the body of the horse. Would you say you're working 10 times faster than you usually work? <laughs> no, <they're faster. laughs> yeah, I, I, I I'm not nearly, uh, I'm not known as a production potter. And for years, as much as I would try, I could never really produce uh, 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 Bob Briscoe uh, was uh, uh, great uh, as a production potter and made beautiful work. Uh, the new new person that I I can see uh, who will be successful is uh, Matt Krause. Mm. He uh, he's he's fast and he has a good sense of uh, design and he's hard worker. Um, and interestingly, uh, he took over. Bob's uh, studio. Um, Bob would always say, I can throw a show in a week and Mike can show a throw a show in about six months. <laughs> but I am a potter and Mike is an artist. But I don't necessarily believe that a simple pot is less art than a than a than a, the most plain, beautiful bowl in the world. So I personally don't differentiate coming from a fine arts background where it was like very specific, but I can see what Bob meant about. Well, there are different fine. like modes of working too, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, it's the cool thing about ceramics. And in, in, in other cultures, and I'm thinking of Japan is that Japanese have a different um, have a different uh, aesthetics of, and it it uh, carries into their art that that it doesn't um, it doesn't have to express necessarily the individual's personality or identity. It is, um, it is more of a, uh, as some people would say, or as a, a Zen person would, might say, a, a justness. It's, it's just just the way it is. And it isn't anything great 
or special. And, and it is just wonderful at this, because of that. And then your young friends, Mickey Opa and her husband, who have branched out from old traditions, are very, very true. Yeah, they're, um, they are um, I don't know, I would say they're they're the hip hip the Japanese artists. <laughs> Mickey and uh, Toyo Kusu are friends who um, do well, I guess that's right. We're getting the idea though of how you're constructing it well. Yeah, it isn't. Um, Maybe exactly right. And in this case, um, we're currently, I would be, these days I begin to create a separation of the legs versus that one. Mm -hmm. And and now I, now I see that I jumped ahead of here a little bit because I would have normally put another piece of clay on the in, inside of this, this side. But this gives you the idea of how the piece was put these other pieces were put together. So, <laughs> Ta -ta. and then is that some earthenware you have uh, rolled into that stoneware slab on the belly of the horse? <laughs> A little terracotta. <laughs> <laughs> A little pinto. Yeah, yeah pentamento. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, anyway, this. You ever see that I'm moment? getting some positive comments on my that you're doing phenomenally well and that I look very beautiful. <laughs> uh, and Amanda also. <laughs> so, uh, somebody was calling these. Uh, who was it calling it? Me? It's okay. They, they called it a mule. Mule, yeah. yeah <laughs> was that Dan? Or? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think I, 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 uh, they, are, they do have it. It does have a big muzzle there. Mm -hmm. I can kind of see that. Are we going to get the surprise at the end? Sure. I think, we're, I think Mike, if you have more stuff you want to show, otherwise it'd be a great time to open the surprise box and then take questions after that. What do you think? Okay. Okay. All right. So, so just sitting over here, these are other tools that I've used after the pieces are made. This this is a, a glaze that has a high amount of car, copper in it, maybe like 50%. And when that's fired, uh, not all the copper is combined with the other materials like feldspar or kaolin or clay or potassium. So what can be done after it's fired, you can Heat up the piece either in a kiln to about 300 degrees or use, use propane and a torch like this and heat up areas. Then, by using, in this case, I have some muriatic acid, which is mild form of hydrochloric acid. This is very nitrate, and this is copper chloride, uh, copper for the green and iron, pretty much so normally it's in rust. And that, that is a permanent uh, aspect. It's just, if you imagine old 
copper roofs on buildings like the City Hall in Minneapolis. It has a patina of, or think of bronze pieces that has a patina. And I'll just come up really close so people can see the depths of those surfaces because they're remarkable. So there's the iron horse. Yeah, and, and, the and, copper and that's horse. all, uh, it depends on what mixtures of, of clay and clay and uh, flux and copper, what temperatures fire at and what uh, chemicals that you're using. So anyway, so back to the mystery piece. Uh, it is, you, some probably will know of you in Zoomers know what this is. If you uh, are interested in bee culture, this is called a bee extruder. I used to, uh, not, now you just heard what I usually say. It is not an extruder, it is a excluder. An <laughs> extruder would be squeezing out the bee. <laughs> that's, that's not the case. This was the bottom of a, a piece that was used to be under the hidden hidden critter inside. Can you guess what it is? Wow. Oh wow. man. I do. This, this is, I should say, give a man's credit to Marla Spivak, the Dr. Marla Spivak. Dr. Marla Spivak. And who I met doing a keto many years ago at the St. Paul uh, gym, and it is just uh, is a great has been a great uh, uh, friendship and with her husband as well, uh, Chris Carlson. They uh, uh, yeah, they've been have enriched many people's lives oh, as wow. well as mine. Oh, look at this guy. I'm going to get closer. Is this horse was within a hive. This, these supers. When I showed you earlier the grate, that is the, the openings of the grate are small enough for the worker bees to pass through. In the lower uh, super cell, I guess it goes, is where the queen lives. She is too big to get through. The workers go in and out of the hive and produce, uh, gather honey, uh, pollen to produce uh, honey. And uh, they are building the comb. Uh, and in this case, the horse was placed into into these supers, and in about well, this time it was about four weeks in time because the weather was a little bit rainy and cloudy. Normally, build much faster, but what you see here was comb is a comb honeycomb that was built under on the underside of the horse's belly. Uh, and that's normal. In the beehive, they'll start from the top down. Wow. And so, this was a piece of your McKnight show, but the mice ate the wings. And so you put the horse back in. <laughs> and now this will be donated to either the Arboretum or to um, Marla's B lab. lab, Bee Lab. Awesome. And it, I don't think in this one, uh, as was the case of the first one, uh, honey was started to be built onto it. But it, anyway, that's so that's that's the mystery piece. And I must say, uh, a a tremendous collaboration with 
with uh, some of the best workers in the world. If not the best. <laughs> the That's for sure. So this, the temperature of this was, was low temperature, uh, fire at low temperature, like uh, products would know, like Kono 6, Kono 4. Uh, this is, of course, uh, one of those deadly glazes, a lead cadmium based glaze. Uh, you can't get a color like that anywhere else. Uh, copper to make the green and there. And you're, you're firing these multiple times usually, right? Very often, yeah. 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 Truthfully, I don't remember on this, but, but I don't uh, hold back from refiring. Uh, mm. uh, I, I, uh, I think it's uh, really, uh, well, for me, it's part of the process. I, I just, uh, it's like any artist, you know, keeps on dabbing on paint and looking at it and thinking about it, you know, mm, I wonder what to do. And uh, at some point along the line, uh, well, I better not do anything else. I might wreck it. So that's when I stop. <laughs> I mean, that happens. Sometimes you don't stop more often than that, I think. So. <laughs> and there are a couple of folks in the chat asking how you repair things when they're broken. Well, we have an excellent uh, <laughs> product. Here's our infomercial section, folks. Uh, I use uh, uh, what they call DevCon. Uh, it's a two-part epoxy. Uh, there are, you know, like, uh, I don't know if Home Depot has a pro their own product, but uh, Let's see, uh, our local hardware store, Ace, Ace Hardware, mm -hmm. and they have a product, uh, two-part epoxy. In this case, this one, I like a two-part uh, five-minute epoxy gel. And the gel uh, hangs onto the surface of your, of your piece that you're trying to glue together. And it uh, five minutes is about a okay time to sort of do adjustments to the uh, position of a piece. Uh, um, sometimes it doesn't quite work out, <laughs> and but fortunately, the the, the backup plan is if it if it is sudden glues tight and you have slid the two halves too far apart or, or, or maybe you had something glued on it and fell off. What you can do is put it back in the kiln, <laughs> fire it up to about 1300 degrees, <laughs> burn off all the... the it says the, attempt uh, this only with really good ventilation, friends at home. That's true, we have a big fan out there. <laughs> and uh, let's try it over again. Uh, I mean, it doesn't... Uh, make for uh, cost per, uh, uh, cost uh, cheaper. It doesn't. Yeah. It increases your cost per <laughs> a lot. And, uh, so, uh, and what are, what about this one where you, it looks like that's definitely not epoxy over there on that bis course. That one. That, that one. I, I use the. Um, I can see his leg. Uh, a ceramic. Uh, the ceramic mender. I don't. This one's probably enhancer. It's not really one I want to look. There are some products that work at at uh, binding two parts together that will withstand a fairly high temperature, you know, like bis temperature. And that's what I used on that piece. Uh, and it has been fired, refired again, but I'm still leery about whether it will really hold or not. What I think I'll do, uh, will, I'll have another 
flat piece of fired clay that it will, it will I will sit it up, set it on. And if there's any shrinkage, the bottom support will shrink with mm. the top piece. Otherwise, the legs will pull apart and likely will crack as the top apart. part. The legs will stick to the surface and the top will shrink. So you get this sort of movement mm -hmm. and likely you'll have cracks in this area. So, uh, questions? What's the torch? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me put my elbow down. <laughs> so so what, you, what you see there is uh, uh, Mike's mother's Miracle Whip chocolate cake recipe. Right, anybody wants the recipe? It's it's easy, but I can give it to you off off the cuff. Two cups flour, one cup sugar, one half cup uh, cocoa, uh, dark chocolate cocoa, or ground ground uh, cocoa. I guess you would say. Two teaspoons of soda, baking soda. One cup of mayonnaise. One cup cold water. Two three fifty in oven for twenty to twenty five minutes. <laughs> it is it is the best best and easiest recipe of all. Mayonnaise chocolate cakes are delicious. <laughs> Oh. 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 Yay. <laughs> well, I often use this for on the pieces to uh, heat them up so that it will react with the chemicals I just explained to you. Um, here. My good friend uh, Wayne Portres uh, uh, helped me with another piece that you might have seen at the Northern Christ Center show. That's the Pegasus with the, with the wings, uh, uh, aluminum wings uh, made out of, uh, uh, I made them out of wax and he cast them in, in uh, sand, burned out the wax and then poured the aluminum in it and I adhered it to the piece. Um, and it, it is that, that world of, of uh, sculpture that introduced me to this patina process, which I uh, quite, fond of and, and for the fact that it's sort of rather organic it, it isn't really you're not totally in control of it not that you're totally in control of glazes either but it's a it's a post-production sort of thing production post process the other things that i like to use uh, is this this is a called a slow speed grinder and these are diamond impregnated discs, discs of varying degrees of size of diamond. In this case, it's an 80 mesh diamond dust. This is 50. This is sort of a coarse, and this is, removes a lot of material. And it goes all the way up to, in my case, 3,000, but I think you could use 4,000. With water, slowly, and the wheel is revolving around. It slowly, uh, slowly polishes the surface. Behind uh, the candle is the high-speed four, four inch grinder, four and a half inch grinder. Great for removing um, things off of kiln shelves. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a dangerous, uh, destructive toy. <laughs> Are you ready for more questions? Anything. All right. <laughs> Let's see what else we got. We have oh. to save up time for your poem. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, is there, I do have a Someone, Patricia, I is wondering how you cut styrofoam. 
Or what do you, how do you actually, make the molds? I, actually, I, I, I just I use a serrated knife. Oh. This is a little bit <laughs> dull, but uh, serrated knife works great. Nice. And Leslie Whelan says, can I hear more thoughts on the spider horse and the babies? Can you uh, do it? Oh, do you have more thoughts on this? Here's the spider horse piece again. Um, what you don't see uh, in this case, the horse Pretty itself close. was fired on its nose, balanced vertically in a uh, 27, was it 27 inch round kiln. And it actually, it actually sort of tipped a little bit. Let me back this turn off these things on it. These are the little babies. This is a little test piece uh, showing a reaction of one of those patina chemicals on the, on the high. Will you patina that? Yeah. How many test styles do you do, Mike? Well, I, I do. I, I do a lot. I, 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 uh, I am over here. Is my, uh, is my alchemy oh, shop. <laughs> These are my, my chemicals, and uh, and the scale and things. It's sort of like I I used I go one of the most wished for. Christmas presents when I was a kid, maybe 12, 11 or 12 was a chemistry set. And what I got was something about this big, opened up like this and sort of was this big, you know, oh boy, this is great. You know, this is what I said to my dad, but you know, what can I do with it? So part of my, my love of ceramics and the whole process is this, chemical mm -hmm. ceramics, high fire alteration of, you know, the forces of nature, you know, impacting on, on lonely humans, you know, and, and organic material. And <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a world unto its own. You know. We have um, Anne Jarrell saying her three-year-old needs to know when you're gonna blow out your candle. You're making a three-year-old nervous. I think the kids out there should sing along with us. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's song. All right. Okay. If anybody right. wants to sing, you have just a little time before okay. we Read do something. that to unmute. Okay. All right. One. Oh, where you don't have to sing. We'll yeah, sing. we'll sing. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> oh, thank you, you guys. <laughs> That's so lovely. Thank you. No. <laughs> I'm begging you not to do it. Okay. For, for the sake of Jan, we're gonna, but, but there is an old uh, play somewhere in the back history that has a addendum to the song. It's very sad. <laughs> oh no. Okay. I can make a wish. Okay. Yay. <laughs> there, there is a, uh, a closing uh, poem, uh, and that uh, I, I actually had a whole mess of things here, with me, but I, I think we'll, we could end with this. And it's called "Advice" by Bill Holm, and Bill was a, a I believe, an English teacher and a piano player from Medina, Minnesota. Maybe it begins with M. The poem is called Advice by Bill Holm. Someone inside us learned only a few steps. The do yourself, uh, excuse me. Someone inside us learned only a few steps. The do your work 
in court for time. The, what do you expect, Waltz? He hasn't noticed yet the woman standing away from the lamp, the one with the black eyes who knows the rumba, and strange steps and jumpy rhythms from the mountains of Bulgaria. If they dance together, something unexpected will happen. If they don't, the next year, the next world will be a lot like this one. Thank you all very much. Thank I had a wonderful you. time. In our minutes, you can answer more questions. Unexpectedly. <laughs> and as, as, a, as a prologue, uh, uh, I'm, I'm ready. Hold on. Well, you I, could thank Amanda for this whole show. I, I do. I do. <laughs> Sam is honestly right. no need. Amanda's <laughs> initiated the whole event that led up to the show and uh, this little uh, dissertation today, which uh, uh, is surprisingly, uh, was surprisingly fun to do. <laughs> uh, there's one thing I should mention about the show, the big piece uh, that I didn't uh, express or didn't talk about at all, is that you don't even have to end with the, the pieces that I, the, the post work that I just told you about. You can actually use paint. Imagine this, these things as acrylics or oil paints, or, or in this case, you know, chemicals. You can apply them to the surface of whatever you're doing. Jan, my collaborator on that big piece at the studio, uh, used her magic. And if you notice the, the green, luscious, soft green, head of the piece of the horse that was her doing, carefully using a chrome base glaze. And on the back side or on the bottom legs, uh, a brownish tone uh, that darkened the, the base color, which was that rusty red color. And we come back to Amanda who said, yes, paint it, <laughs> rub it off. Add a little wax. Do That's it. True. And I there did was, it until Mike said, "Don't of pictures. do anymore." <laughs> <laughs> yep. Until I got the text that I think you might get mad at me if I keep going. <laughs> yeah, there is, I do want to uh, uh, give uh, Joe and my good friend a yeah. little okay, heads Joe. little heads up. Uh, Joe did a tremendous. Mural. He's always he's been a photographer all his life, and and it's been sort of a love hate relationship. But it was through Joe, through my mother, <laughs> who was a model for a chocolate mix commercial, and Joe uh, in, Joe. met my mom, and she said she is the right person for this commercial. Told me. Told the art directors and they brought them together. And, be and, Joe, and Joe was was the sort of entered our lives. Uh, I have to uh, admit, I don't know if Joe wants me to say this, but everybody else knows that he fell in love with my mom. <laughs> uh, and then, you always have one friend I, that's in love with your mom. As a side note, uh, <laughs> Uh, we became uh, great uh, bosom buddy friends, uh, art, uh, heartfelt friends. So Joe uh, went for many years doing his commercial photography work. He, by the way, did the first photograph for Prince's album, of his portrait. Uh, from there, uh, he went on to do many, many things, but when he retired, he explored his desire to do a mural. 
And how he got it, I don't know. He sort of stepped into a hot bottle, burning coal, burning mine of, of, of fire in a way, because what the mural was, was 2,000 feet down in the Sudan uh, iron ore mine in, where was it? What town? Here? Sudan. Tower, Tower Sudan. Tower Sudan. <clears throat> and uh, 60 feet wide and 25 feet high. 25 well. feet high. And it is basically the interaction of molecules and people's minds and uh, explosion, explosion, yeah, the, the creation. Awesome. So, uh, check it out. G uh, Joseph Giannetti, is that your website? Giannetti. Just Giannetti.com? Giannetti.com. His mother, she stood there with a cup of choke cocoa, and everybody in the studio fell in love with her. <laughs> Especially I did. <laughs> then the first time I went to his house, I thought we were going to crush grapes. We were crushing clay. Oh, oh that's right. <laughs> yeah, right. Now we made clay in a, in a boat mixer that's about as big as from Jack and Panda to me. You know, about this wide and you know how grinding down clay like that, uh, like the grapes in the in the vats uh, for making wine. That sounds great. Joe, Joe, Joe had it down. He knew it from in his genes. You know? We also all have a friend whose house you go over to and then you're surprisingly put to hard labor. I think everybody has a friend like that too. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, Two minutes to go. It's, uh, it's like, uh, and it's hard, hard to imagine to culminate uh, it with a low torch candle and blowing out on, on a Miracle <laughs> chocolate whip cake. Whip cake. Miracle whip uh, is the is the mayonnaise to use. There Nothing is. else. Right. It is. Uh, it's the secret element, and it's easy, uh, and it tastes great. Well, with that, should I wrap us up so we can eat the cake? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'll turn the camera back around and just say a farewell to everyone at home watching along. Can they see it again, Amanda, or over and over? Or? Yeah, yeah. So, folks, so thank you so much for being here with us today. We had so much fun, and I hope that you did too. Thanks for all your questions and well wishes. This will be probably take us a little bit just to process, and then it will be up on our YouTube channel, and we'll make sure that we put that in an e-blast, an email newsletter going out so that you all know when it's ready. But it will definitely be online as soon as our little fingers can make that happen for you. So thanks again, and Thank you for spending your Saturday with us.